Good evening, everyone. My name is Norman Goda. I am the Norman and Irma Brayman Professor of Holocaust Studies at the University of Florida. I am also the director of the Center for Jewish Studies here at the University of Florida, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this evening's event, The Last Ghetto, Understanding Theresienstadt, an evening with Anna Haikova. I would like to introduce our guests, uh, and then we will have a conversation um, about the book. We'll start with our guest of honor, Anna Haikova received her PhD from the University of Toronto and is Associate Professor of Modern European Continental History at the University of Warwick. She is a regular contributor to mass media outlets such as Haaretz, Süddeutsche Zeitung, Tablet, and Tagesspiegel. She is, of course, the author of The Last Ghetto and Everyday History of Theresienstadt. Here it is, a brand new book based on over 100 archival collections in 10 countries. Welcome, Anna. Uh, joining me in the questions uh, this evening, I am delighted to introduce Alan E. Steinweiss. Alan is the Raoul Hilberg Distinguished Professor of Holocaust Studies at the University of Vermont. He is the author of several books, including Kristallnacht 1938, Studying the Jew, Anti-Semitic Scholarship in Nazi Germany, and Art, Ideology, and Economics in Nazi Germany, the Reich Chambers of Music, Theater, and Visual Arts. He is currently writing a history of Nazi Germany, a new history of Nazi Germany, which will be published by Cambridge University Press. Tonight's event is sponsored by the Norman and Irma Brayman Chair in Holocaust Studies at the University of Florida. And we are going to talk for about 45 minutes and then we'll uh, open it up for questions. If you have questions, uh, please type them in to the Q&A function. And I have to um, issue uh, also a special thank you to Anna Haikova because not only is she our guest, she is our guest past midnight. Um, in, in the UK. So <laughs> we'll, we will start. I, I, I want to start the questions um, with, with this, and it, and it has to do with the reason for writing the book and, and how you came to this topic, because there are, as you know, a number of books, um, recent books on, on ghettos and camps. And I'd like to start with your comment at the very outset of the book that Theresienstadt is a well-known ghetto, but a poorly understood ghetto. What, what do you mean by that? Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm delighted to be in Florida um, and um, I will try to be awake and um, well, if not eloquent, then at least coherent. Um, so bear with me, it is past midnight. Um, there is in chat is something that kind of everybody interrupts you when you research it and say, basically explain to you its history and it becomes reduced to the children's drawings, to the culture life and to the propaganda aspect, to the Red Cross visit um, and to the propaganda movie that Nazis showed here in 44. Um, but how people actually lived here how we can uh, draw conclusions about Jewish history and transnational history of the Holocaust, how can we understand agency, sexuality, um, people's coping mechanisms to the Holocaust. These aspects that I, um, as I was writing this book, stood so much in the forefront of my thinking, these aspects are pretty much completely in the background when you look at the propaganda visit and whatnot. If I can share, um, I came to the, story as a young student some almost I, I mean, 20 years ago 18 years ago when um i traveled for the first time to israel and my late grandparents on paternal side who during the war were um co in communist resistance and they helped their jewish friends go into hiding had a couple of friends who survived um and went into israel and these friends did not go into hiding with the communist group but rather uh, were deported with everyone else to today's Inchstadt. and um, back then, I mean, I know everybody's dead. Back then, they were in the 70s and 80s when they were pretty fit and were driving me around. And we would sit and talk and eat hummus. And they would share all of these stories about the raising stuff, about dating, about playing soccer, um, about hitting on girls from the Netherlands, um, and about what did you actually eat and how did you manage um, with toiletries and whatnot. And I was completely fascinated. And already as a young student, I was first completely amazed at the dimension of the social that I was listening to. 
But I also thought we have here at hand a great case study of society in extremists. Now, what I did not realize then and what I can tell you today, the stories I listened in 99 in Haifa and Tel Aviv and were not, were basically the stories of the social elite. But sometimes it's quite useful to start with the social elite and then move to the other dimensions. So in a way, I started at a point that goes against the established narratives of today's instead of people having a happy youth, happy 20s uh, in today's instead. And that then helped me kind of see the bigger picture, not only ask, how can I, um, as Andre Angrik, another Holocaust historian, uh, told me once, how can I put one more pin on the map, on the cartography of terror? But how can I write a history of today's in at the same time offer some analysis of how people react to the extreme and what is actually society? And I guess my main answer in that is the social continues surprisingly long. And a lot of reactions that um, before we have not recognized as valid or as relevant are people trying to stay alive try staying communicating and actually quite meaningful moments of agency. However, to recognize them as such, you really have to immerse yourself into the vault of the ghettos and of the camps. So what I've been doing a lot over the last 10 or 15 years, I spent a lot of time with this book, was really kind of putting myself into the heads of these people, of the young and of the old, of the Austrian, of the Danish and of the Slovak and of the Czechs, of people who were former working class and people who used to be bankers. In a way, it's a little bit thinking like an anthropologist, but a historian who's looking at very different sources than uh, anthropologists. And um, therefore, I was not trying to tell one story, but many, many stories that are a bit like a chorus, many choruses overlink over each other. And if we want to understand today's in Shot and by extension, other concentration camps and ghettos, we need to make space to listening of these many, many voices that then bring together the society. So um, um, first, let me mention uh, the, the sun is setting here over Lake Champlain and it's playing tricks with the lights, but I was in the shade for a while, but I think it's better now. Um, I actually have a, a small question that you can probably answer quickly before I ask a big question that you'll need more time for. And the small question is this. So, uh, it, your book is called The Last Ghetto, An Everyday History of Theresienstadt. Uh, is there a particular reason why you use the, the term Theresienstadt instead of the Czech Theresien? You know, in the case of like uh, Auschwitz, for example, has become quite a sensitive issue that uh, when you refer to the camp, you use the German mm -hmm. term. Mm -hmm. uh, when you uh, refer to the community that was there, mm -hmm preceding the camp, you use the Polish term. So mm -hmm. is, there some rel is there some significance to your choice of terms? Mm. So uh, dear audience, at the moment, I should say that this uh, book launch is particularly joyous for me because I've now Norman and Alan since a long time and Alan since an even longer time. And I like to call uh, Alan a little bit my doctoral uncle because he co-wrote his uh, PhD together with my doctor mother at UNC. So um, this is a discussion that Alan and I have been having and Alan of all people knows about my pragmatic side. Um, I don't believe that Theresien slash Theresien has a similar debate akin to uh, Bevzets and Belzets, um, to um, Auschwitz and Oshwenshim. I'm a native Czech speaker, so when I say Theresien, it sounds not completely recognizable to the American or to the German ears. Some Germans still say Theresien because they find it fancier or more politically uh, correct. And um, I notice that people do not often pick on Theresien, cannot make it up. Theresien shit is a little bit more frequent. So I went with the one denominator throughout the book. I use Theresien, Theresien shit and ghetto interchangeably. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Well, so my bigger question, which is something entirely different. Um, uh, you say in your book that uh, there's a, a master narrative uh, concerning the Theresienstadt ghetto. Um, uh, so what, what is that narrative and how does your book uh, challenge it? And does that master narrative have something to do with the large old book by, by Adler? Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. So this mass narrative, um, so that I'm not completely ivory tower-esque, is uh, this kind of um, concept by historians and anthropologists and sociologists describe something that we would call a corporate identity of the society, how they like to see their uh, past or how they like to make sense of themselves. It's not something that really happened because history is not like the one thing that happened and a coherent story. But similarly to how the Danish have the master narrative, how the uh, Danish king wore the Star of David and how then the fishermen out of the goodness of their heart in October 43 brought all of the Jews over the Öresund or whatever the sea is, um, we have similar uh, narrative uh, for Theresienstadt, we have similar narrative for the Blitz in the UK, indeed we have a similar narrative um, uh, for many parts of American history. And the mass narrative goes, and you will soon recognize that some of these aspects, indeed many of these aspects, is how Theresienstadt became well known to this date, is that Theresienstadt was a place where people who experienced extreme persecution and humiliation and were stripped of everything, showed that Jews, who were always kind of seen as these kind of white collar jobs as attorneys and professors and doctors, actually can show muscle and can build a meaningful community that will take care of the weakest, the children, um, and will put on beautiful cultural events, um, similar or maybe even better to the civilian life before. It was a community that was full of solidarity, that never experienced um, any um, criminality or violence, and where uh, Jews showed that they can kind of um, have a triumph of human spirit. Now, some of these aspects mirrored things that happened in Theresienstadt, but more importantly, uh, the story, the legend of Theresien, as I call it, mirrors how these people wanted to see themselves. And this corporate identity gave them most importantly meaning. There is nothing beautiful to be gained from being, you know, stripped away from your beautiful apartment from your friends to have to wear Star of David and to be sent to a dirty place. But if you have a meaningful story that surrounds it, uh, you can feel better about it. This is the background of master narratives. This is also why people can feel so emotional about it. I still remember the debate some 15 years ago when Beate Meyer and Wolf Gruner found out that the Rosenstrasse, uh, the German street where uh, many Jewish partners from mixed marriages were kept for a week in February 43, that the Nazis did not send them there in order to eventually send them to Auschwitz, they sent them there to count. So the arrests, the protests of the Gentile spouses did not actually bring about the um, uh, release. And by breaching the mass narrative, many historians and even more importantly survivors were profoundly unhappy. I remember being at the conference. However, Adler did not push for this mass narrative. Adler created his own stories, but um, the stories Adler told were mostly taciturn, and taciturn stories do not have the capacity of making people feel good and therefore kind of creating this corporate um, identity. In fact, Adler, while it's an enormous um, book full of facts, many of which are reliable, is a book that is very rarely read from the beginning to the end. It also kind of hangs on the structure. And what I think has not really been done yet would be reading Adler not as a history book, but as a discourse. As a survivor who becomes a historian, who becomes a scholar, who writes a book and sees it in a very particular context and then um, um, compares such a book, say, with Philip Friedman um, and others, because it's a very different approach to history writing. Um, it's one that in some ways is linked to, um, you know, the culture of Praga cafes, but it's also one that is so very linked to the person that Hage Adler was. I mean, I spent a week in Marbach in the literature archive going through his correspondence and he was one of a kind. That, that book for people who don't know is uh, it was the standard book on Theresienstadt for years by, by Herbert Adler, um, which, Adler. Was, yeah, which, which was only translated into English, what, a couple of years ago or something? Yeah, by my friend Belinda Cooper and others. The book is somewhere behind me. If you see a book that is about this <laughs> wide, that's Hage Adler. So, so I had a question. Um, 
uh, about uh, the relationship of everyday life to the administration of Theresienstadt, because the book is fundamentally about, about this issue of, of everyday life um, on, on issues like work, on issues like food, on, on issues like medical care, um, where, where and how people lived, uh, how, how things in the ghetto were, were improved, not improved. Um, but, you, but you tie it all uh, to the administration of the ghetto. And uh, this, this is an administration, you make the point that the Germans more or less left alone. And so it was a Jewish administration. But you also make this point that it's an over administered ghetto, that, that the administration was, was very, very large. And, and, and I, I, I'm curious if you can tie together uh, the nature of this over, overly administrative administration um, on the one hand and, and people's everyday lives on the other. No, this is an important question. It's a big question and I will endeavor to answer it. I hope I will not last on the way. And if I get lost, please. Well, we can follow up. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I think I want to start slightly historiographically uh, and uh, say to our audience that uh, one of the questions that has been kind of launched a thousand ships uh, for Jewish historians of the Holocaust is the question of the unit of the Jewish councils. Um, have they collaborated? Uh, did they deserve to die? Did they have any leeway? Was this leeway meaningful? What should we do with Rumkovsky? What should we do with Chernyakov? What should we do, in my case, with Benjamin Momostein? Uh, these people were very often men. Uh, they very often, if they survived, were very much hated after the war. Some of them were actually um, even uh, put on trial. And we know about Kasna that uh, he was uh, murdered in Israel after the war. So this was kind of the narrative that until the 1970s, 1980s um, dictated how people thought about what they called Jewish collaboration. And then the big shift um, came, I think, in 1990s when Dan Dina um, started looking at the Jewish councils and said, the point is not to judge what they did. The point is to try to understand what leeway they hit and also how come they failed to understand what the Nazis had in store with them. And he calls it this kind of very Dineresque epistemological gap. And when I teach it to my students, they get big eyes and get afraid of this word epistemological. And it's actually, well, it may be a bit unnecessarily difficult, but what he means with it is people always try to understand any situation with the best possible outcome. When we look back, a year ago, when we we're going into the pandemic or when we were in the beginning of the pandemic, everybody was like, but by the fall, it will be over and we will teach face to face. And now the penny is slowly, slowly starting to drop that the pandemic has changed the world for the foreseeable future. And we do not quite know how it will happen. So uh, the Jewish councils for a very long time continue to believe that the Nazis want to work with the Jews, that they are very important productive force and that they are not going to be killed. They do not, even though they have the writing in front of them, they do not look at it as something uh, that uh, basically the Nazis jobs is to have these transit ghettos and sooner or later murder all of them. Um, and it is in this spanuk, in this tension between these two positions that you have the whole tragedy of the Jewish councils. And I spell it out because um, 30 years later, this is still a really, really important bit that kind of helps us to get from this blaming game of the Jewish collaboration. Uh, Whitman Bourne just this morning drew my attention to another social media battle, which this one I said, I'm not going to look into it. And then historians such as Doron Rabinovich, uh, Beate Maya, um, and most recently Katarzyna Pelson um, have looked at various moments um, of uh, Jewish functionaries, what leeway they had, um, how they used it on masculinity, on power, but also how much they are hated by the rank and file Jews. Because something that is so fascinating is when you look at the intensity of hatred and history of emotions, the particular hatred of the survivors goes against the former Jewish functionaries, not against the SS. For Theresienstadt, we have cases of a former couple from the uh, commando in Vulkov, who is um, um, sentenced to death and executed 
whereas the German or Austrian commandant of said commando, Franz Struska, received six years. And the, the, the outrage of it all is completely lost in the 40s and 50s, and in fact, on some of the historiography uh, to this day. So this is the position in which I uh, found myself. For me, uh, Beate Meyer's uh, work on the Reich Association in Germany was really uh, influential. And um, she was able to point out how the Reichsvereinigung people were very much legalistic. And they had this habitus of always trying to stick to the rules. And I thought it would be worthwhile to try to understand the habitus and mentality of the various leaderships in today's ancient. We have basically three, it's the three elders of the Jews as they come. First the Czech Zionist, uh, Jakob Edelstein, then the German, also Zionist, but basically it's never perceived as a, a Zionist, Paul Epstein, and finally Benjamin Mumstein, who also is technically Zionist, definitely nobody sees him um, as a Zionist. And because the first two of them were murdered and the last one survived, basically the narrative went that Benjamin Mumstein was the bad one who collaborated, and the first two ones uh, were the good ones, um, especially Jakob Edelstein. And what I did was try to understand bureaucracy um, as a meaningful field in which people negotiate power, negotiate policy, fight with each other. Um, and it's actually a really interesting, lively field, how you see people who before the war had certain positions of power, be it as doctors, as engineers, um, as clerks, as leaders of the Jewish community. And for them, it's immensely important to have any position of power whatsoever in the ghetto simply that they do not lose their status, but also it's for them an important means of control and of agency. So they are not just Jews, they are somebody who can decide. And with um, more and more people arriving from Prague and Brno and Berlin and Vienna, as the Jewish councils are being shut down, the Theresienstadt administration grows. I was able to find out, um, and I'm not a German native speaker, but I speak German, I think fairly well, how eventually you have a system of two leaders for every department in Theresienstadt. You have the Leiter and you have the Dezernant. And for a long while, I did not understand what is this Dezernant. And then I realized that in Austrian German, Dezernant is the political leader, whereas Leiter is the, actually the, the technical leader. And the reason for that was um, the old leadership needed to make space for all of these old acquaintances and colleagues and friends as they were coming in and therefore you had this bigger and bigger administration working and many more departments happening. When you look at some point in I think September 44 at the organigram, at the organizational overview of the many branches of Theresienstadt, it goes something like 50 pages in Adler. And then Adler reprinted many of the documents, just 101, basically, in his book. So also, in when you look at it uh, uh, from Theresienstadt, from the contemporaneous sources, it's also some 46 or 50 pages long. The point is not that this organizational chart will help us understand 101 how life in Theresienstadt was, but rather what is going on in people that they generally believe of having a department for shoe repair or whatnot will help them change Theresienstadt and by extension the Holocaust. It will not, but if they survived, and even if you look at their diaries and memorandums and whatnot from Theresienstadt, they're completely caught in their thinking that they are making a difference. And that goes to my earlier point that you asked before on the importance of agency. How can we capture agency? When we look in retrospect, we know that these people were not able to stop the Holocaust. But the point is not whether were they actually able to make a difference, but what they understood as a meaningful action. So you have Gertrude van Tijn in the Netherlands, who was not deported to Theresienstadt, who in her memoirs obsesses about the many confirmations about the Palestine exchange list that she was able to give to the people who are about to be deported to Sobibor. And you have Benjamin Momishtan, who is obsessing about something similar, how he's able to get 20 people exempt from this list and remove them, replace them with someone else. Still, 20 people are going to die, but he thinks it was the correct people, and therefore this was uh, meaningful. So one of the things that I was able to discern here is this complete dedication to their work, this profound faith that they are doing a difference, and this was all worth it, and also the faith that Theresienstadt is going to be able to survive until the end. 
And the answer is yes and no. The reason that unlike Wuch and pretty much all other ghettos is the only ghetto to stand until the liberation. In fact, it's liberated one day after the capitulation of Nazi Germany on the 9th of May, 1945, hence the title of the book, The Last Ghetto. However, in fall 44, two thirds of the people in Theresienstadt are sent to Auschwitz. Most of them are younger people and only a fraction of them survives. And um, until pretty much the end, people in Theresienstadt believe that everybody who has been sent to the East, that is at least the young people, that they are going to make it. And some one or two weeks before the liberation, as the desmarches start pouring in, among them are some few dozens of emaciated survivors whom they said goodbye back in October 44. And this is the moment when the penny drops. And this is the moment when for a lot of people, the illusions in which they lived dropped in. And I guess this is kind of the chronological framework in which um, I tell the book, because my point is not to say how naive of them or also how, how, how stupid of them, but rather why do people believe that and also a certain um, humility and empathy towards these people because we need to believe in order to live. Sorry, that was a long answer. No, it was wonderful. No. Um, so Anna, I have a, a question about uh, nationality. Uh, I think many people, when they think about the role of Theresienstadt in the Holocaust, basically think about a camp for German Jews that was located uh, in uh, uh, Czechoslovakia. Um, when they, when when many people read your book, I suspect that they will be surprised by uh, how important the what what really stands out is kind of the the Czechness of the place. Um, uh, a major theme in your book um, is the, the, the kind of contrast or even competition between Czech and German national identity among the, the Jewish uh, uh, inhabitants uh, of the ghetto and the way that, you know, that the whole, the whole ghetto society was very much shaped by, by that particular factor. So, so my question is, uh, do, do you think that uh, these nationality issues among the Jews, these differences, uh, played a, an especially important role in Theresienstadt, say in contrast to other Jewish ghettos about which a lot of work has been done, for example, those in Poland? Um, yes and no. So... Uh, when I started researching the book, some one or two years into working on it, I was fascinated because I realized that the Reisenstadt did not engender a common Jewishness. And I guess I kind of expected everybody was deported here because they're very Jewish or because they had a Jewish grandmother, I mean, at least two Jewish grandmothers, and uh, that would engender a common identity. And it did not engender a common Jewish identity. It did engender the mass narrative, which kind of binds together almost everyone in Theresienstadt. That was um, one of the previous points that we uh, touched on. But as people came to Theresienstadt from Czechoslovakia, Germany, Austria, Denmark, Netherlands, Slovakia, and Hungary, um, uh, what became um, kind of a marker was seeing in each other differences. And these differences, I was struck, they expressed, and I call it in the book with ethnicized terms. I mean, honestly, I am today with you in the US, these, uh, if we could say ethnicized, we could also say racialized. Um, I show over and over and the sources are deeply saturated in language that obsesses about people's eye color, about their cheekbones, about tone of their skin, about whether they are athletic, how they move, that they wear makeup, the way how their um, character is. And um, one of the German Jews even develops the theory that the Czechs are angry and aufbrausend, that they're angry and full of a spirit because um, you have the 
form of volcanoes in Czechoslovakia and therefore you have all of the spas where you go to drink the hot water and therefore the Czechs are like particularly angry. I mean, you, you are kind of nodding your head because it's just so... Um, too, too much sulfur in their blood. Well, yes, I, I think this is not how it works with people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We are all equally angry uh, or quiet or whatnot. Um, and as I said, all of these people are essentially European kind of middle class uh, Jews. So I do not think there were real differences in their cheekbones and uh, whatnot. But what is interesting is how they start having this ethnic case and how they ascribe character and looking differences according to where people came from. And then these ascribed differences start carrying meaning in its own right. So what was for me interesting on the example of today's Institute is to see how ethnicity is made out of nothing and how it actually starts having a life of its own. Most importantly, rather than having a number of ethnicities, um, you see an emergence of a bit of a binary between the locals, the Czechs, the protectorat student, and the foreigners. And the thinking is accepted by pretty much everyone in Theresienstadt. The Slovaks, the Hungarians, uh, the Danes, the Germans realize that they are not the locals and they look at the locals, at the Czechs, as somebody in position of power and somebody uh, who uh, belongs. So that's the point that I wanted to make about Theresienstadt. At some point I even started thinking, would it not be interesting if Theresienstadt lasted 10 years or 20 years, how would have the language position change Would everyone eventually learn Czech, because while German is the lingua franca of Theresienstadt, you see how Czech is the language of power. So some of the older Germans in their letters to the children, if they if the children live in mixed marriage, like in Hamburg or whatnot, assign with maminko, uh, mama, or they call the shelf a polička, but they don't know how to spell polička, so they write it with CZ. So, and you see the Czech creeping in into the language. Rolf Grabova, one of the former high-ranking uh, minister clerks in the Ministry of Finance, uh, recalled um, how the transport in May 44 was put together and whenever um, the Jewish functionaries would get all wound out, they would just completely switch into Czech. And he would sit there and be like, guys, I don't speak any Czech. This is so rude. And they were like, ah, don't worry, another two years in the ghetto, you will be completely fluent in Czech. And, I think many of the people in the audience will know that Czech, uh, why it's a beautiful language, it's not an easy language, it's not like Italian uh, or English that you can pick up relatively easily. So the point here is, um, and I guess that was important for me for the whole book, to look at the question of ethnicity beyond just Jewish history and to ask it as an anthropologist, how is uh, ethnicity, how is race constructed? And I think there is in China the Holocaust is a very instructive moment to think about the bigger issue. And with that, I answered the first half of the question. We know from work of people like Nick Waxman, who was in Vermont just the other week, and Maya Zudeland, and many others, that many other concentration camps were definitely very characterized by the clash or by the tensions and um, alongside of many nationalities. And historians have kind of looked at it and touched on it gingerly. We have some great studies about translation and interpreting in the uh, camps, but how ethnicity really plays out and what it what it happens to it from a kind of the point of view of um, history of nationalism and history of ethnicities, that has not been done yet. So I have written this book on Theresienstadt as a case study how ethnicity will play out. And now I will start answering the second half of the question when you look at the Central European or Eastern European history in 20th century or second half of 19th century, obviously nationality is an immensely important topic. And in the last 20 years, we had a big shift for Central Europe with the indifference to nations. Uh, people like Peter Judson, Tara Zara, Chet Bryant, Tatiana Lichtenstein and others. Uh, offered here really important insights, but they all also mentioned that as these countries drift into the war, the place, um, the social place in which you can be indifferent to ethnicity starts disappearing. And that is in is an important part of the story, how people are reminded of their ethnicity and start feeling it very keenly. 
but it can also happen that people feel very keenly Czech while they actually do not speak Czech so well. And you see it, how they express it in their diaries. They also sometimes are encouraged to drop German and actually start speaking Czech. There is this story how the first transports from Brno, Brun, which was largely German speaking, arrive to Theresienstadt in December 41 and somebody writes on the entrance to the barrack where the Brno people were put in, Brňáci mufte česky, people of Brno speak Czech. Um, you have stories of people from Opava, from Tropau, which is um, in um, uh, on the Silesian border, who actually learn Czech only in Theresienstadt because there's such a huge social expectation. And this kind of sifting and shifting the importance of ethnicity, the fact that while there is this much loved story about how Jews are these amphibians who speak both languages perfectly and sit in the cafe and drink coffee and hang out with Kafka and Brod, I wanted to complicate the story. I wanted to show that there are Czech Jews who speak German and can't pronounce it. And I wanted to show that there are Czech Jews who really start sweating when they have to differentiate uh, the dative and accusative um, with the, uh, with the um, side words and whatnot. And that all can be observed on Theresienstadt and therefore in order to write better histories of nationalism and Nazism in Central Europe of the 1930s, we need to put Holocaust into it, not only to um, come to terms with the issues of uh, collaboration in local uh, populations, of collaboration, but also because how the Slovak and Czech and Polish and whatnot Jews react to the Holocaust is part of that story. And I know that Anja Cichopek's uh, current book is addressing exactly these issues. So that was a bit lost, but I hope I made my points. Can I follow up on that just a, a little bit? Because um, if, if you sort of follow this um, through your book, you, you also, you, you see how this plays out in practice in many ways, that the, that the young Czech Zionists um, are, are sort of the elite of the ghetto, uh, whereas the elderly Germans who are arriving after mid-1942, um, to, to put it politely or not, um, but, but, you know, what you wind up seeing within this, within this question of nationality is a very different um, representation of Zionism. Now, when we think of Zionism during the Holocaust and Hechalutz, which you, which you talk about here in Hashemir Hatzair, we think of people like Mordechai Anjelevich and Zivil Lubetkin and Abba Kovner and, and Mordechai Tannenbaum and so forth. And, and yet here, um, the, the young Czech Zionists are, they see Theresienstadt in very different terms. Now, of course, part of this is that, um, you know, the pace of killing in, in Poland is, of course, very different than the pace of killing in, in um, Theresienstadt, and in, in certainly in 1943 anyway, in the part of 1944. But um, how do you explain this? So there, there's a um, uh, Peter Long, I'm quoting from your book, uh, page 97, if everyone has it, um, uh, Theresien... Ardent Zionist, Peter Long noted, Theresian meant for me uh, the significant success of the Zionist movement, um, which is a surprising thing to, to read. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, Peter Lang, who passed away just last fall, he was one of the last survivors of Theresian Shed, who experienced it as a, a grown up person. Lang was special because he was so blunt. Yeah. Um, and I think he said at some point, it's, it's the tragedy of our generation that we have nice memories of Theresienstadt. You have the social elite of the young Czech Jews, largely men, but also women, not only Zionist Norman, but also the Czecho Jews, the assimilationists mm -hmm. um, and of the communists. Um, and these people have grown up with each other. They played soccer, uh, they went to the cinema, uh, they learn swimming in the same swimming pool. So yes, they have some political differences, but also they have the same networks, they were on the same transports, they are all cousins and friends and whatnot of each other. And these are then the networks that will help them get good jobs, put them high on the indispensability list and therefore protect them from transports. And if they have good jobs, they have access to better food. And they will probably also have um, access to better accommodation. So these are the many ways with which you can ensure uh, their positions uh, in Theresienstadt. I think this Zionism, similarly to the Jewish history, to the uh, question about what can we learn 
about what is ethnicity by observing uh, the Holocaust is this similarly about Zionism. You don't have Zionism that is cast in stone, similarly that you don't have Jewish history or Jewishness that is cast in stone, and you don't have Czechness that is cast in stone. Um, it is always produced contextually. I remember um, I learned a fair deal of what I understand to this date about Jewish history from Derek Penzler, who since then moved from uh, Toronto uh, to Harvard. And um, there is this going joke uh, in the Czech context from the 1930s about what is this Zionism. And Zionism, the joke says, is when one Jew sends the second Jew for the money of the third Jew to Palestine. Tatiana Lichtenstein um, um, and others have shown very persuasively how Zionism played out in the Czech context in the 1920s, 1930s, how eventually these people kind of constructed these very powerful discursive modes about staying home and what it means to be Jewish rather than going to Palestine. Yes, if the Zionists survive, some of them go to Israel with a great zeal to sit in a moshav um, and you know uh, be bitten uh, by the mosquitoes and whatnot. And some of them actually become really important members uh, of uh, the Israeli politics. But the Czech Jews largely remain incredibly Czech. And those were the people who as soon after 18 and came, flew on all of those El Al flights back to Prague because they never stopped being homesick. They, in fact, still spoke Czech at home. They would uh, bring uh, back Czech uh, smoked paprika and the griddles for making Czech pancakes, uh, livance, uh, and whatnot. I don't bring these sentimental stories, and I found them very moving. Uh, to make a sentimental point, but what it kind of means, um, what means habitus and how long lasting uh, it, um, it is. But because they have lived in the framework of what it means to be Zionist and what the movement, the Hnuti, enabled for them, and that it was the movement that kept them off the transport list for such a long time, and it's only in October 44 that pretty much all of the Hechalut is eventually sent uh, to Auschwitz and then to Kaufering, it's a um, satellite camp of Dachau, incredibly uh, deadly. Uh, Alan, you know, Eddie Prime, who wrote a really great book about Kaufering. And this is the horrible conditions in which um, many uh, of them, or pretty much almost all of them, uh, perish. So I guess I did not write the sections on Zionists to make a bigger point about history of Zionism. But I guess as a gentle reminder that any political movement is also equally made by its context. Well, Norm, you were following up one of my questions, but now you get to ask a question yourself. Oh, OK. Um, well, it, it's got to do with culture. Um, uh, Theresienstadt, uh, <laughs> is known um, uh, for, for this outpouring of culture um, owing to the talents of the people who were sent there. And, and, and yet the most prominent cultural displays were not necessarily Jewish. In fact, we have a question um, from one of our guests. He says, one, one of the many, um, we were told that there were many Christmas trees, you know, in Theresienstadt, uh, the first, first December. Um, but in terms of, uh, in terms of high culture as well, uh, you, you have a problem uh, with this notion of culture as resistance. You know, you, you say that for you, it's, uh, it's a little bit too redemptive. And I found that interesting um, because uh, up, up until very recently, uh, the, the Verdi uh, Requiem Mass was being performed in, in various venues in the United States um, by an outfit called the uh, Defiant Requiem Foundation or financed by something called Defiant Requiem Foundation. And uh, as, as, you know, not only Verity necessarily as defiance, but culture and Theresienstadt as defiance. And yet you have a lot to say about um, culture. You, you, you have a problem with it as a redemptive form. Um, but you also sort of place it within this national context as well, yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
No, so I already meant to do it at the last two questions that I got carried away. So before I do that, I will say that the book has a website uh, called thelastghetto.org. Um, and the website is useful because you will find there the images in color and high resolution. Maybe Nomi, you can write it into the chat or into the Q&A so that people can check it out and also maps. And uh, some of the images I discuss in the cultural section you can uh, you can look them up the drawing that Eda Krasa received from Frita or the drawing from a soccer match uh, from 1943 or uh, this drawing by Lotka Boreshova of the girl jumping through the frame because alas in the book it could only be in black and white but I should not complain um, the uh, book is uh, 22 pounds or 34 dollars so that's kind of very affordable and for that um, I am grateful um, and also know before we finish, we should tell to the audience that if they don't have the book yet, there is a voucher code that they can use for 30% off. So, and now having made a plug for the voucher for the book um, and for the website, I will start answering the question. Um, this is, I'm not here discovering the wheel. Um, I'm built here on Shelley Gilbert, um, Christiane Hess and other people who have written whole books um, uh, extensively on culture. Um, what I found important here is that culture is part of the functions that humans do in order to be human. We do not do it necessarily to resist, we do it because we need it to be human and it gives us um, sense. Um, the people who were deported to Theresienstadt, that is one of the uh, questions uh, remark, were largely very middle class or upper middle class and they were uh, largely assimilated. So one of the ways and the really important ways uh, for them to express uh, their identity, their groupness, their belonging and their cultural capital, really important here, was through culture. But also what kind of culture? Is it high culture or is it low culture? Is it kind of your comfort food or is it something that you will attend in order to prove to your Yourself, what a cultural person it is. Um, Today we will be either watching Emily in Paris because it's a crappy weekend and we feel sorry for ourselves or can we reach The Wire which is not an easy watch uh, but it's super interesting and we can feel kind of good and intellectual and really really uh, dark or whatever one would be watching uh, today in uh, if you have already watched The Wire or you know you can watch some great documentary TV series uh, about something really depressing. Um, so uh, the point here was first to ask about the functions that these things have for people and to read the sources, the diaries, the letters and whatnot accordingly, because especially with culture, the master narrative and dotted with kind of this uh, spiritual resistance and whatnot. So it's quite important to do a methodologically clean work and to also um, reflect on when were the sources written and to what um, audience and then to look at the economical context in which um, culture is produced but also attended. So while the tickets for all of these events were supposedly free, in the barter economy of Theresienstadt some of them became very quickly expensive and we know about Requiem that these uh, audiences, that these performances were sold out and then some people who otherwise were well liked and had access to say cucumbers or tomatoes, people like Eva Rubičková, um, was actually not able to see the second, I think, premiere of Requiem because um, there were just a finite number of places and she was not able to barter her uh, cucumbers or whatnot uh, into seeing Requiem. And if we want to understand the setting in which the culture was produced, but especially um, consumed, the economical context is front and center. Then comes that various generations and various um, ethnicities have also different tastes. So Bartered Bride, this uh, opera by Bertrix Smetana is a really great example. So if you grew up Czech, Bartered Bride, Prodana Nevista is like the Alpha and Omega. It's like your amazing thing. Um, but a lot of German Jews look at Bartered Bride and they see it as a kind of a better operette. And I will now dare to say something controversial. Um, something similar is the case for some people with Hamilton. Um, two or three years ago, my partner and I went to see Hamilton here in London 
And she almost ran away after half an hour because she thought it's like a really shallow, horrible American operette that has horrible lyrics and stupid music. Because for her, it was not real opera. I mean, you see already, like I'm touching your toes. I'm sorry that I'm spilling um, and spitting on Hamilton. I thought it was like pretty fun, but I would never, I did not see what's the big Edo of Hamilton. Because how we understand culture, what is meaningful and what carries all of this cachet with it is always constructed by the habitus, by the social field from which we come from. And this is why I also included this little drawing uh, by the uh, River Moldau, by the River Vltava and Charles Bridge, that uh, Eda Krasa, one of the cooks who passed away uh, recently, and who was also one of the uh, important um, uh, testimonies uh, for Defiant Requiem of Charles Bridge, because if you guys uh, look at this drawing, I think most of us will agree that this is not a particularly deeply dimensional drawing. It's a bread and butter drawing of Charles Bridge for someone of working class, relatively simple background like Krasa, but Krasa does not recognize it. It comes from Frita, one of the most important artists of Theresienstadt, and therefore he cherished it, kept it and gave it uh, to the uh, Holocaust Museum that very kindly allowed me to reprint it. And this that I'm not saying that it's not okay to collect simple art, but that we need to recognize how high and low culture is um, constructed, but also that it carries a meaning. I do not want to make any statements about Defiant Requiem because I like to sleep at night peacefully. But I just wanted to show the... Uh, Thank you. See that? Well, Norm, did, did we want to turn turn the uh, floor over to questions from the viewers? How much sure, we uh, we should do that. And I, I want to urge people, if you have questions, um, go ahead and send them through the um, Q&A. One question is, can you please repost the discount code? Okay, wait, I will send it to you by phone, and then you can share it. Okay, you'll send it to me. I will send it to you, no? Okay. Wait, 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 how, how do I do that? Did I save your number? I am. I, but, yeah, because you texted me earlier. Huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah, but I, I, I need to save, save it. Mm -hmm. Okay, sorry. I you, you talk to me and I will save it here. You know what you could, uh, uh, Norm could send it back out over the invitation. No, I already sent it to him. Okay. Norman, did you get it? No, not yet, but I will. Basically, it's A-A-F-L-Y-G-6. So if you order the book from Oxford University Press, you just have to enter that under a, in the box for a discount code. Yeah, so it will not cost you $34 plus $5 postage. It will cost you $24 plus $5 postage. So you save $5. Or you can go to your local bookstore and not support Amazon. You, if you still have a local bookstore, um, feel free to go to that local bookstore. Um, while we're waiting um, for questions, and again, I would urge people to, to send them in, there, there is kind of the larger question of um, uh, where, where, um, where you think that Holocaust studies um, might be headed uh, as a result of this methodological approach with regard to pre-war Jewish communities and, and, and wartime ghettos. So I will answer frivolously and I will say that I want Holocaust studies to head. Um, I find the interaction between uh, perpetrators and uh, victims really fascinating. The kind of hierarchies of power, who is trying to understand whom, how hard violence plays out and also the emotional component to all of that. And it's something that I uh, endeavored to do in, in the book, how little the Jewish prisoners care about the SS and how little the SS cares about the Jewish prisoners. 
but the um, two groups that actually care about each other a lot is the Jewish functionaries vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the commandant, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the SS. The commandant uh, much less, but definitely more than to the rank and file uh, Jews. The issues of agency and uh, uh, the sociology and social and cultural history of the victim society in the Holocaust is something that I hope will um, experience further research. I know that historians such as uh, Florian Zabransky and others have been looking at masculinity and friendship and sexual violence. I think we need to look more at gender and sexuality and we need to look at sexuality beyond the binary of sexual violence um, and romantic love. Um, I myself am building my second project on queerness in the Holocaust and also kind of the obsession with homophobia. Uh, ethnicity is another really important project. And last but not least um, is the issues of narrativity and testimony. People like Alexander Garbarini, Laura Yakush, uh, Lisa Lev, um, and Natalia Alekshun have looked at um, how people were driven to bear testimony after the war, but also how does testimony, how is testimony impacted by the fact that you do not tell just some story, but you tell the story of a genocide. What does it mean to these people? Why do they need to bear testimony, testimonies, agency, as revenge? Um, I mean, for your own volume, uh, I wrote that essay about whether testifying in front of court is basically some kind of uh, narrative. So to kind of look in um, as a kind of history inspired literature scholar as testimonies, um, that would be super interesting. I'm gonna share this website one more time, Anna, because when I shared it the last time, I, I just shared the Frita um, picture. Mm -hmm. But everyone, this is this is the website, um, thelastghetto.org. Um, and and some of the images that are in the book, you're right. Um, they're in they're in living color um, here. Um, no, no, all of the images you see here are in the book. Yeah, yeah. All right. We have a question. Um, were there independent community organizations in Theresienstadt? If so, in what environment did they operate? Um. No, everything was part and answered to the Jewish self-administration. I guess one could wonder if the illegal communist party that met in the underground was an independent organization. But I think that if you are an illegal resistance group, then you're per se not an independent organization. Otherwise, the meetings of the Zionists, the meeting of the assimilationist movement, um, the meeting of the Protestant church, the meeting of the Catholic church, were all somehow uh, linked or at least um, uh, aware by the Jewish uh, self-administration. And I mean, that's something, Norm, that you and I talked about uh, before, that uh, the SS left the Jewish self-administration run the ghetto because anyone who has experienced this uh, university uh, bureaucracy knows how much work administration is. But they kept a close check on what was happening in the Jewish self-administration, first by ordering the Jewish elder come every morning and uh, give reports, counting all of the population um, every day, and also by a network of Jewish denouncers. And the Jewish denouncers, uh, that's something that I uh, look at also, is um, these were uh, Jewish inmates who volunteered vis-a-vis -vis the SS to inform on uh, the Jewish population, hoping to get a um, level of control, but also to be exempt from the transports to the East. So with this kind of dense information network, it could be <coughs> only some 30 members of the SS uh, kind of uh, overseeing the ghetto, controlling the ghetto, <coughs> but not doing it. But when you then look at, um, say, some of the minutes of the cultural department about what are they going to put on for plays and whether the putting on display by Kleist could um, anger the Germans or not, you see that, yes, they have 
out of our side significant leeway, but they constantly question what they are doing and what they are not doing. So it is in this context when we ask about, you know, cultures resistance is some of uh, uh, the most biting critique of the cultural events in today's in go against the German Jews. Is this resistance? No. Uh, if I could return for a moment to the question of culture uh, that we were discussing earlier. Um, you know, you, you mentioned, Anna, as you write in your book, that uh, it's important to avoid a, you know, a redemptive narrative. Um, uh, and, you know, that's with regard to, uh, you know, thinking of, you know, thinking of the the performance of the Verdi Requiem or Brundy Bar or something as, you know, acts of, you know, resistance against, um, uh, uh, against the Nazis. Uh, but I, I think it's important that you're, that the listeners who haven't read your book understand that, you know, just because you're saying avoid a redemptive narrative doesn't mean that you're cl not claiming that, it doesn't mean that you're claiming that culture was not significant. Uh, the way that you explained it earlier, that this was an expression of their humanness and so forth. And I just wanted everybody to know that's a really important theme in the book and constitutes, you know, pretty much uh, yeah. an entire chapter. Yeah, and you know, um, I, I said it's like one o'clock here, so forgive me, I'm blanking out. This will be sacrilege on the name of the uh, conductor of Requiem. Um... Schechter. Yeah, Schechter, Rafi Schechter. When Schechter puts on a requiem, he doesn't do that because he wants to piss off the Nazis. He puts on a requiem because in the 30s, requiem is being negotiated as kind of this very technically challenging, important thing that you put on if you are um, a conductor of rank. And it is in this context that he puts it on because he wants to prove that he's a great conductor, even in the context of Theresien Schechter, that he's basically continuing his career. And here, you guys, um, you see basically a continuation of the point that I've been doing before with the Jewish self administration, with the composers or musicians in Theresienstadt. You also see it with the doctors. The doctors continue training. They have the uh, medical colloquia. And if they survive the war, they write their uh, recollections from Theresienstadt. And if they were in the camps afterwards, in the camps afterwards, and submit it as part of their CV, because they see themselves foremost as doctors, and the Jewish self-administration sees themselves foremost as administrators. One of the questions was about um, if, if, if any of the Czech Jews saw themselves foremost as Czech Jews. That's what I've been kind of trying to show how what the Rezinshet does to people, what concentration camps and ghettos do to people. They do not necessarily create an identity as a Jew, they create an identity as, um, in some cases, um, as a member of a certain group in Buchenwald or in Auschwitz. It definitely creates an identity as a member of a certain ethnic group. Of course, for Polish Jews vis-a-vis -vis Polish Gentiles, it's a different story. And then for certain people in certain positions, not for everyone, um, a very strong uh, identity to their job, because in this job, they can believe that they have a level of agents and control. And that's immensely important to people. You can see in Theresien Schott and also for pretty much all Holocaust victims, how they keep stressing about the control and responsibility they had because people hate powerlessness. So, so they kept stressing what decision they could make. They obsessed about the morality and uh, the moral dimensions of their choices and going on transports, leaving parents behind or going with the parents, leaving the lovers behind because they experience profoundly powerless uh, moments. But to acknowledge how powerless we are kind of breaks testimony. It was, I guess, Norm, the other, uh, the other dimension of this point about testi testifying is how people experience extreme stress. So uh, my uh, old uh, doctor Mutter Doris Bergen has shown, and it's incredibly important uh, point that while we know from Shaul Friedlander that powerlessness was this defining experience of Holocaust victims. We have Holocaust victims constantly obsessing about the responsibility they had while the perpetrators say, oh, it was out of my hands. Um, I really had no choice. 
um, I had to, you know, fulfill the orders. This is what Stangl kind of says throughout his uh, Into the Darkness in Serenje. And that's one of the things that I uh, followed throughout the book when agency comes to the fore and how agency is for, important for people to keep their sanity throughout. And that makes them human. We have, we have a question um, from a, a former classmate of yours, actually, um, Seth Bernstein. Um, jumping off Anna's comment on testimony and interviews, I wonder if she could speak about her relationship to her interviewees and their relationship to her work. Mm. Uh, Seth, actually, I did not interview people for this book. There are great collections of oral histories uh, that have been collected, um, you know, in the 80s and 90s and even in the 70s. So um, I was an um, anthropologist looking at other people, all histories and working uh, with those. And um, if I interviewed anyone, it was kind of um, in passing or sometimes um, I had this experience that when people thought uh, there is a Holocaust historian, he must interview me because this is what Holocaust historians do. And then you are kind of in this awkward position where they serve you coffee and cake and Holocaust survivor and you need to interview them because otherwise everybody will be upset. So you try to interview them. Uh, but um, I was often in the luxurious position that I had say, uh, early oral history from the 1960s, from the Theresine Memorial. Then I had an um, 1990s um, oral history um, in Czech. And then I had a video testimony from uh, 2005 from the Spielberg interview or whatnot. And then you can compare how the testimony developed. I guess that's also a norm that I did uh, for uh, my essay in your chapter about the Holocaust trials how you have people uh, testifying against a former tormentors in 47 then burying testimony in 60s and 70s for the Theresa Memorial and then giving an oral history as a really old guy uh, in the 1990s and how the testimony uh, develops. There is a bit of a fixation on mm -hmm. oral histories uh, for um, Holocaust histories and I have felt very keenly that we have great oral histories out there that there is a methodological problem to people who have been interviewed many, many times. And it's better to go uh, to an early version than maybe compare it a few times. So that's something that I endorsed. I think we can take a couple more um, because we want to let you get to bed. Um, are, are there records of specific inmate jobs, roles, and functions in the ghetto? Um, uh, this person had grandparents who perished in Theresienstadt and wondered um, what the Indian lives were like. Uh, rarely. We don't, we have only fragments of the Jewish self-administration. And I remember when I started conceptualizing this project at some point in 2005, and I was still um, uh, a May student, I talked to uh, a professor of sociology. We talked about network analysis. I knew quite well what network analysis does, and I knew I cannot do it with these fragmentary sources. So um, that's something that I was quite aware of. And therefore I decided to go uh, for qualitative methodology um, and then include statistics in some very specific uh, contexts, say for mortality uh, or for ethnicity, uh, or then also for my samples of the petitions to be taken out of transport. But if there is anyone listening whose relatives were liberated in Theresienstadt, for those some 15 to 20,000 people, we have a collection of cards um, that indicate the job of these people in Theresienstadt and also all of the addresses. And that's kept at the Czech National Archive in Prague and has been digitized also by the help of my colleague Tomáš Fedorovic uh, from the Theresien Memorial. But for most people, we will not know where they lived and we will uh, not know what jobs they had. Um, we may sometimes have some of the traces if they perished in Theresienstadt, about two thirds of the people who perished in Theresienstadt have a so-called traditional Anzeiger death certificate that are scanned and viewable at holocaust.cz, an amazing uh, resource put uh, up by my colleague Teresa Štipkova. Um, and at the death certificates, you have these people uh, last address and sometimes also any of their relatives in Theresienstadt and where they accommodated. But it's not enough to triangulate it into network analysis. But I, I guess he did not want to hear about network analysis. I'm sorry. Well, Anna Haikova, thank you so much. Uh, it's a wonderful book. I'll, I'll hold it up this time. Um, the, 
my notes in it. The, the last ghetto, um, I, I sent everyone. Oh, Alan has it too. We all have it. So everyone has to go. Um, the discount code uh, you have from Oxford University Press. Um, and uh, everyone should have the website, thelastghetto.org, which I do recommend because the, the images in the, in the book are wonderful, um, but uh, the, the, um, the site has them in color. I'd like to thank our guests again, uh, Anna Haikova and Alan Steinweiss. Um, everybody, this is our last event of the academic year at the Center for Jewish Studies at the University of Florida. And we're trying to find a way, if we go back to face-to-face um, -face events, to also do live streaming. So um, you're on our mailing list, whether you want to be or not. And um, I'd urge you to, uh, you can of course get off, but I, I urge you to um, uh, check our website from time to time as well to keep up with what we're doing. Uh, Alan Steinweiss, Anna Haikova, thank you very much. Uh, everyone else, have a good night.